Good evening. Um, where do I start? Uh, I start with the fact that I'm scared. Never say that. I'm scared. I'm always scared. I'm almost always scared. Um, I'm scared you will remember all the things I wish I've never done. And I'm scared that you will admire all the things I don't deserve. I'm scared that I will forget your name. And I do, always, whoever you are, sorry. <laughs> I'm scared that I will say too much. I'll say the wrong thing. I don't, know too, I, I don't know the right thing to say at the right time. Or that I'll reveal too much accidentally when I talk. Sometimes I think... No, I'll pause for a second. This is a story that ends well. But I'm not allowed to end on a positive note. It's the nature of the beast. I think, sometimes I think life is sliding doors, weird sliding doors, and one, one of which I go back to. When I was in sixth class, like the last year of primary school, uh, my parents' marriage fell apart. We went from um, living on one side of town in Newcastle where, you know, it was the middle class part of Newcastle to the rough western suburbs of Newcastle. And I went into my first class uh, in this school with the teacher and the teacher said, first question, this is pretty random, are you a Ford man or a Holden man? <laughs> now, this, this was a very important question, um, of which I never thought of the answer. Um, now, there was a right answer. The right answer was, I'm a Ford man. Now, and the reason that was the right answer is because I'm a Ford man. My dad was a race car driver who drove Fords at Bathurst for three years. Forgot that. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? And they, he said, well, Ford or Holden? Like, you know, pick a side. I said, I don't know. Um, Mum drives a Volvo. And in that one moment, the next seven years of my life went from being the coolest kid in school to being the biggest frickin' dork in school. Lost it. I only ever get one chance to make a first impression. Um, when I was in high school, I, I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to, like, I'm in awe, like, it's actually unfair to put me on a stage tonight with all of these musicians, with all of this talent, because that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to write songs. I wrote songs. They were bad songs. They were depressing, self-indulgent teenage songs. They were the bad form of therapy that you do when you're a teenager and you're writing songs. That's my Twitter handle. <laughs> and it's not a coincidence that that's my, my Twitter handle because despite the fact I am tone deaf, have no sense of rhythm and cannot carry a tune, I have carried these songs with me like the world's most depressing mantras for the last 20 or 30 years. At one moment in school, I switched from history, in which I was doing reasonably well, to music. Because I thought, I want to be a musician. Well, I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be depressing in a way that impressed girls, not alienated them, whatever it was. And I remember my report card in music. It said, if Marcus continues to improve at this rate, he will probably pass next year. <laughs> I didn't. And I didn't. Didn't improve, didn't pass. As it transpires, I hated school. Uh, I was in an environment that just didn't understand me and I didn't understand it and I was in a world where everything overwhelmed me and no matter what I did, it came out wrong. Everything came out wrong. It's a story I've never told aloud, and I wasn't sure whether I was going to include it tonight, but um, I screwed something else up. I was about 16 or 17. There used to be a train line ran down the back of the house near where I used to live. And uh, the train it was the, the train line between uh, New, uh, Sydney and Brisbane, so the XPT would go by a few times a day, or the, uh, the trains up to Maitland from Newcastle would go by a few times a day, or every hour, or whatever it was. And the coal trains would come down from the mines. I wanted it to be over. I didn't want to go on. I just didn't, my, li I, I, my life was so painful, I just didn't want to live it anymore. 
I picked the wrong train. So if you're ever trying to top yourself on a train line, don't pick the coal train. Pick the XPT, or at the very least, pick the one that's the passenger service. The problem with the coal train is that it moves very, very slowly. And you have long enough standing on the train tracks to look up in the eyes and see the eyes of the train driver. And you realise that what you're not doing is ending it. You're just passing the burden on to some other poor fucker who isn't you. XPT. I, school was school. Um, I don't know. Did that, who hated school? All right, we're not the only ones. We turned out all right. I, I'm suspicious of the ones that loved it too much. Um, I went to university. That was great. Met people who thought like me, sort of. I met people who were tolerant of my weird idiosyncrasies and we were part of a community of people who did stuff together. I got into, by virtue of my um, incredible application to my study, my or fourth or fifth choice subject at university, communication studies, at the University of Newcastle. I did it for two years. Uh, that's, you, some of you may have noticed that's not long enough to add up to a degree. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was invited to leave. Well, I was actually kicked out. Uh, and I love to tell this story as though it's someone else's fault. Like, I was the victim of the big bad bureaucracy at the university because I was a shit stir and all this sort of stuff happened. And there is a version of that story that I can tell that sounds like that. But apparently in failure lab, you're not allowed to blame anyone else, so let's just be honest. I fucked it up. I didn't turn up in class, I got involved in everything other than my studies, and I walked out of university thinking, I have screwed up my one chance to be in the one place in my life I ever felt like I made any sense. I then became part of what uh, the statisticians refer to as the long-term unemployed. Between about 19 and 22, didn't have a job. Well, I had the odd cash in hand thing here and there, the odd project here and there. I was directionless. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I got so beaten down by applying to so many minimum wage jobs that I didn't get, I gave up applying. There was 40% unemployment for my age group in Newcastle at the time. It was not entirely my fault, but I, in hindsight, probably could have done better. I couldn't conceive at that point of a world where I could have made a contribution of any value. Then my girlfriend let me, left me. She said, um, well, I'm pretty sure it was the catalyst, really. Um, we'd been together for a couple of years and we had one of those conversations that you can only have between two people who know each other intimately and know the best and worst of each other. She said, um, your biggest problem is you're not doing anything. And I thought about it and I said, that's completely unfair. I've got the world's third, seventh and ninth highest scores in civilization too. <laughs> but her wider point may have in fact been correct. I wasn't doing anything. My problem wasn't that I was failing. It was that I had come to believe that I was a failure, that that was me, that was my identity. That was a catalyst. From then on, I started to do things. Every second thing I've done, I fucked it up. The good news is um, you fuck up quickly and things that work endure longer. So as you build and build and build, people start to remember you for the stuff that hangs around, not all the stuff that didn't. I could go through so many. The fundraiser. <laughs> the fundraiser. <laughs> Where I lost so much money I had to leave town, get a job, <laughs> pay it back next few years. The failed idea to start a bar, that didn't work. 
um, the festival where I'd booked eh, half a dozen of the biggest-ish bands in the country, had to cancel it two weeks out because I'd fucked up the insurance policy and the permit with the council and the park and 2,000 people later couldn't come along. <sighs> I'm not allowed to be positive tonight. It's the deal. <laughs> I'm not allowed to give you advice. What I've learned over life is that I have made every mistake you can possibly make once. Once. The only time you truly fail is when you keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. What I've learned is if you fuck up everything once, you fuck up enough, wide enough range of things once, <laughs> you start to become really good <laughs> at not fucking up a very long list of things. <laughs> now I like to talk about failure. I romanticise it. I've somehow made some... I wrote, a, I wrote a book last year and I had a chapter in it called Failing to Fail Enough, which was the, my observation of what led to this project, a thing I started, the Renew Newcastle thing, a few years ago. And it, the problem was the city had the same attitude that I did, that it had failed and it wasn't worth doing anything. Not that people were f trying things and the things that they were trying were failing. I am here because I am a specific confluence of perfect failure. But I'm scared. I'm still scared because when I look in the mirror, I still see that guy. The one who thought he was a failure and still sometimes wonders deep down whether he still is. Not the man who's here because he failed, but the man who failed at everything he ever tried to do. And I am scared more than anything because I look out on all of you and I fear you see him too.